Okay. Um, for the, the presentation, I, I assume that you are sort of familiar with Nix and you are sort of familiar with Haskell. So I don't assume any super deep knowledge, which means that I don't go into very much detail, right? The idea is that what I would like to achieve is that after this presentation, you know how you can install any package from Hackage, and we have, in fact, all of Hackage in Nix package, so anything that's up there can be installed in Nix. Um, I would like to show you how you can install a compiler, then use that with Kabal install or whatever you want to develop, um, and then the more advanced use cases then to create a whole development environment where you have the compiler plus a deterministic set of libraries that you can use to develop your own applications. And then last but not least, um, you would probably, as a Haskell hacker, would like to integrate your own code into Nix packages, and that's, that's fairly easy too. Okay, so without further ado, the <coughs> most baffling thing about an Haskell package is that none of them show up in the package list. So when you run Nix with this uh, minus Q minus A parameter and it shows you all the packages, there is not a single ha Haskell package in there. The reason is that Nix packages as a whole has some 11,000 packages and Haskell packages are 9,000 something. So if we would actually add those to the index, we would immediately double the amount of packages in Nix packages. And that means that um, this kind of querying, installing operation would become significantly slower for everybody. So that's why we don't have this kind of stuff visible in this global index. If you want to install a Haskell packages, a Haskell package, you have to use this um, attribute path where you basically say nix env minus i minus a and then any number of, of attributes of Haskell packages that you want to install. The Haskell packages, they all follow the same scheme. You have Haskell packages dot and then the name of the package on Kabal, uh, on Hackage. So whatever the package is called on Hackage, that's the attribute name you want to install. If you want to list the Haskell packages, you can do it, but you have to give this special um, minus A parameter for Nix and to actually look in this subset of the top level. Otherwise, it won't do that. So if you want to find out what's available, then there is a way to do it. It's just not enabled by default. The <coughs> when I say Haskell packages set, there are actually many Haskell packages sets because we have the latest a major release of every single GHC for the last eight years or something. So we have a Haskell package set, which is this first one. This is the default. This is the one that currently refers to GHC 7.10.1. And then we have for every other compiler a separate package set, which has this slightly different name. They are spelled differently. And there you can see the entire package database, but built with that particular compiler. This is actually rather useful because um, compilers, GSC compilers, have this habit of breaking backwards compatibility quite a lot and sometimes people don't update their packages. So there are quite a lot of packages that the latest compiler can't compile but an older one actually can. We take advantage of that in Nix packages as well. So when you install, I don't know, Idris for instance in Nix packages, you actually get a version that's compiled with GHC 7.8 I think because that can compile it and the newer one can't. So the available compilers, um, you can also list this compiler database which contains all the compilers that we have and this is the list that we currently have and that are actively, kind of actively supported. So these all work fairly well. Um, I shall say that um, we have no package set for GHC and UHC because no one figured out how to use those compilers to build a, a Kabbalah package. I'm sure it's possible somehow, but uh, no one put any effort into it yet. Um, this a special feature is this uh, GHCJS, uh, that's the uh, Haskell to JavaScript compiler, which is something I don't know anything about. All I know is it can compile Haskell code to JavaScript. And it also can, it yeah, has a whole package set. Okay. <coughs> So if you want to install a compiler, then that's the way to go. You just pick one of those compiler versions that you install, install it into your profiles, and there's your compiler. The compiler doesn't have any packages. So any libraries that are available on package, it doesn't know any of them. If you want to use Kabbalah install to install them, everything is fine, you can do that. But if you now think, aha, 
I, this means that I can install a Haskell library into my profile and then GHC will know about it, right? That's not the case. It's not possible because GHC is compiled into the Nix store and to a certain prefix. And when you install the library, then GHC assumes that that library is installed into the GHC directory. That's how these installations normally work. And as you know, that's not possible in Nix because the derivation is immutable. So when you install a library like I don't know, Transformers or MTL or whatever, then it's installed into its own completely separate place and the GHC compiler has no idea that it exists and it has no idea how to use it. So that's why we have this uh, <coughs> special package set. Oh, that's actually later in the presentation, that's in the next slide. So, okay, a little bit more about installing compilers. I thought it might be nice to show you a concrete example. So if you want to install GHC 7.10.1, the easiest way to do it is uh, via Nix shell, where you just give the attribute name on the command line with minus, minus p, and that will give you a shell environment in which that package is in your path, and then you can install it. And obviously you can install any other compiler the same way. If you want to build a Haskell package that way, a particularly nice feature is that you can run this Nix shell, again with any particular compiler version, and then instead of opening a shell, you run Kabal configure. And what that will do is it will figure out all the paths on your system path of the compiler and store that in your local build configuration, and then you can use Kabal in that directory and compile with that compiler without being in Nix shell, because it has remembered all the paths. So that's a nice way to set up the uh, Haskell package that you're working on, you can set it up to compile with that compiler and then any process on your machine can build it and work with it and it's going to work fine. It doesn't need to be inside of Nick shell. Mm -hmm. is, it, sorry, is it similar to a sandbox? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, from the Cabal point of view, it's not a sandbox, but it's the same mechanism, of course, right? All the local information is inside of your directory and everything you do works just nicely. There is... Uh, Another way to accomplish the same thing, which is basically what Nick Shell is doing, right? You can install any number of profiles. You don't have to install a package into your home profile, but you can create any number of profiles and install any number of packages in them, and then just set your path, your, your path variable to find that particular version, that particular version, and then you can switch between different development environments and easily test your code with different compilers and so on. The same thing here, right? You can come out Kabbal configure and you give it the explicit path and then everything will just work. You don't need any special environment or any magic stuff to, to do that. So this um, is equivalent of basically Kabbal uh, sandboxing? Yeah, I, I'd say so. Yeah, exactly. Um, the, there is one disadvantage to that, namely um, all these environments that you set up there, um, they are subject to garbage collection. When you run the garbage collector, the, the garbage collector, then there is nothing that tells Nix don't throw away this GHC, right? Because you haven't registered anywhere the fact that you want to use it, which might be might be fine, might be just what you want, but it might also be that you actually want to keep all the stuff that you're doing, and if you want to do that, you have to locate those profiles in a special directory. On Nix also you have a variable pointing there automatically, so you can easily find it, but it's typically this profiles per user, your username path, and everything that you create underneath there, Nix will automatically consider alive during garbage collection. So if you put your profiles there, all the stuff they contain will never be garbage collected. I think it's also if you put dash dash root, it will add it to the Nix thing. Uh, I don't know, to be honest, it's possible. I know the option exists, but I'm not sure how it does, right. never used it. Okay. Um, so that's kind of the boring part. That's just give me a compiler. That's nothing special. You can download it from Haskell.org and it does the same thing. So now things become interesting. Um, you want, when you want a compiler, you want a compiler with a certain amount of packages. And you typically want those packages to be reliable, deterministic. You want them to download in binary form because you don't want to compile everything, right? And that's where Nix comes in. And the way to do that in Nix is this magic function. It's called um, GHC with packages. So that gives you an environment which contains the compiler as well as the list of packages that you, that you provided. If you, this thing is a function, 
which as an argument takes a function. That function will be called with a package set, as Haskell packages, right? This is the package set that you choose here. And then you can just add a list of all the packages that you want, and then all those packages will be registered in your JG installation. The nice thing about this approach is if you want the same environment with GHC 8.7.8.4, for instance, you just edit those three letters and then you have the exact same environment with GHC 7.7.8.4. Uh, okay, <coughs> so in this particular example, um, I configured that uh, that environment as part of, of an override. I, overrides are super important in Nix. I'm pretty sure you'll come across those uh, frequently. Just, just quickly, the, the, the basic idea is that you have this, this config file which is at a particular location and it contains an attribute set. And when Nix starts up, it will replace all the attributes that are in your normal Nix packages set with those that you specify in here. So this gives you the ability to replace any attribute from the official Nix package set with something else. And you can, of course, add attributes, which is what I did here. So if you configure this kind of stuff, you have a Nix package that has an attribute called my Haskell env, and it will look like any other package in Nix. This, uh, this kind of, of <coughs> stuff up there is uh, a little exciting, but that's an idiom that you'll always see in the Nix is this this notion that you have um, a package set that um, the first arg it's a function actually this package overrides is a function right the first argument it gets is the superset which is the Nix package set without any overrides applied this super refers to the normal Nix packages set and this package set contains an attribute packages and that is the package set after the overrides have been applied. So you're using this deep, lazy evaluation time without semantics here, right? This function knows this is my input and this is the output I'm going to produce. And it gets that as arguments. And this is nice because, for instance here at this place, I refer to the Haskell package set as self. So what this means is, this is the Haskell package set, whatever it is after the overrides have been applied. So if you add a second override in here that replaces Haskell with something else, so you replace Haskell packages with Python packages, then this will actually refer to the new name. So it's always a, it's a very, very powerful idiom that uh, all over the place. We, we use this stuff to customize packages, especially in, in, in the Haskell, Haskell packages set. Anyway, to get started, you basically can cut and paste it into the file and then you have your, your working environment. And obviously, you, you can define any number of environments like that. They are not limited to one. Okay, <coughs> so this GHC with packages wrapper, what does it do? The problem is that GHC it is compiled with, this is my, my root directory and all the libraries I know are in here. The problem is there are none. So how do you get libraries in there? The basic idea is that we take all the libraries that you configured, that you want them, and then we copy them and the whole GHC directory into a new path, and then we wrap GHC with a script that on the command line tells us, this is your library directory. So in other words, we redirect GHC to use a library directory that's been created on the fly to contain exactly the stuff that you want it to contain. So this is how, how that works. You have this real GHC, which is the, the naked compiler, and then this points to some on-the-fly generated environment which contains all those libraries that you want the compiler to know. There is uh, <coughs> those environment variables that you see there. They are um, important for one case. There is this, um, this library called GHC Pass which is a, a fairly popular library and what it does is it contains the installation paths of GHC and people use that library, Haddock uses that library and many other programs use that library because they want to access GHC's data. Now the problem is that when we compile that library it figures out some path of this is the path of GHC and that's what it will return but this is not the path that we want it to return, right? This is some path from the naked compiler but we wanted in this case to return you a path that contains all the libraries that you wanted to see. 
And what we did is we patched that Nix LHDHC path library that instead of hard coding the path, it returns them from those environment variables. So that's the whole trick, right? When you configure those environment variables, then everything that's based on GHC pass will know the compiler you are actually using with all the libraries you're using. This is important, for instance, for, um, for Haddock. This is important for G GHC mod, this uh, Emacs and BI plugin, which gives you all these fancy editing features. They all rely on this kind of stuff to work. Which is um, why <coughs> I also recommend that you configure those variables in your, in your shell setup. The easiest way is to just have them point to your profile so that you don't have to hard code any paths or anything, right? You just copy that into your bash or C and then you will always have a valid working environment. Okay, now there is a, a similar thing you can do with Nick Shell because often you want to compile a library and you don't know in advance all the packages that you need to do that and you don't want to reinstall your profile and everything. And then you can use Nick Shell with this kind of snippet to create, um, here you create this GHC with libraries. Then you have a <coughs> derivation that just contains that as a build input. And when you run Nick Shell, what will happen is that it sets up the environment with this GHC in path, gives you a shell, and in that you have the compiler that you want. So you can put these shell.nix files in all your projects. And for every project, you put in exactly those libraries that you want to use in that project. And then you can be super certain that you don't access any, any, any libraries that you don't want to access. Or, right? You have this super tight sandboxing stuff where every environment contains exactly those packages that it's supposed to contain. Um, this is a nice gimmick. You can also parameterize the, the name of the compiler, make that an, an argument to this file. And then when you call a Nick shell, you can on the command line pass a string to that argument. And then you can switch your environment from one compiler to the other just by choosing this appropriate name on the command line. It's very neat, I think. OK. Finally, um, these environments are automatically provided for you for all packages in Hackage. So when you have a Hackage package that's called Haskell Packages.lens, for instance, then this package has an attribute called env. And this env attribute defines an environment which you can use to compile this package. So in other words, if you want to start hacking on the lens library, which has a lot of dependencies actually, then you can do this. You download the source code, you change into it, and then you say, give me the environment for the lens library, and then it will start up a compiler, an environment which contains everything that you need, and then you can start hacking on lens. And you have that for every package in package. Now, suppose that you're working on some Git version of lens that is too new, right? It has additional dependencies, and Nix package doesn't know about those. And you also have a way to generate those shell files completely automatically. There is a tool called Cabal to Nix, which you can install uh, just from the package database normally. And then you can run it with this minus minus shell flag and the current directory, and it will write this shell.nix file for you. So you don't have to, to worry about it. And then you can configure your build and, and work with it, or you can enter the, the interactive environment, whatever you please. And this shell <coughs> environment looks like this. This is the file that's automatically produced if I choose MTL because it fits better on the screen. Lens is actually fairly long. And then here it defines a build for the package with the dependencies. And then it just chooses this env environment for this particular package. And that's what your shell will enter. Okay, obviously, <coughs> if you build your own Haskell packages, um, you want to build them via Nix2. And an easy way to do that is to use this Cabal to Nix uh, program to generate a Nix package for your Cabal package, for your Haskell package. And then you just add it to the overrides like so. You use this call package function to, to import the, the, the Nix, default Nix that you generated earlier. And with that configuration, you'll have the full package as part of your Nix da package database, like any other package that's distributed by Nix, only it actually points to your 
development work in your home directory. Uh, so this foo is so this foo is then available through all the you have to put it into a specific GHC set or um, if you yeah if you want if you have packages that depend on each other then it's more complicated. This is just I assume you have a, you wrote a Haskell package that contains just an executable, mm -hmm. and you want that executable to be part of your Nix installation, right? And this would be the way to do it. If you have multiple libraries and those libraries depend on each other, then you have to register all of them in Nix, obviously, and then this is the way to do it. Um, the Haskell package set, all the Haskell package set, they have um, as argument as an argument a function called override. No bullshit, it's called overrides. <laughs> the overrides function. And that function by default is empty. And what you can do is, you can say, replace that function with the function I'm giving you here, and then you can mess with the package set. In this case, you have again, this is the Haskell package set after the overrides have been applied, this is the Haskell package set before the overrides are applied, and then you basically just add those two attributes by referring to the development sandboxes on your local disk. And then both of those packages will be part of the Haskell package set, and they can depend on each other. So if um, bar is an input of foo, then it will automatically be found and it will automatically compile it. So that it all works out transparently. What is a little clumsy, unfortunately, if you want, um, if you want these packages registered in all the package set for all the GHC versions, you would actually have to duplicate this now like five times or so, which is annoying. But doesn't seem to be a problem in practice. Okay, the nice thing about Nix, or one of the nice things about Nix, is that you get a binary caches. And we also, we build um, all of Hackage. So basically whatever you're, you're messing with, chances are that you can get binary packages downloaded from, from Hydra. And to configure that, it's important that you um, make uh, you register your, your binary cache as, as a trusted cache because Nix will not download binary through just anywhere. You have to explicitly tell, us, tell it these are the caches that I trust. Um, the above thing is something that Nixos users put into their configuration.nix. If you don't run Nixos then you have to edit this Nixconf file directly and, and add it here. And after you've added <coughs> that line you can on the command line of every Nix command that you run just say use this binary cache, and then Nix will transparently connect to that server, ask it, I'm trying to build this and this and this package, do you have binaries for me, and if it does, it will download them. So this means that, yeah, typically you basically don't compile anything if you're lucky, it's quite, quite yeah. nice. The, is the last line, because um, by default, uh, Nix looks into Nixos org, right? Yeah, there's this cache. So there's an extra org. binary cache in this case would be Krypton. Um, this is um, the, the difference is that this build farm is what populates this channel. So what it does is it has a job that builds the entire package set, and when the entire package set has been built, all that stuff is pushed to the cache where every Nix installation will automatically find it. But if you explicitly say ask this server for packages, then you will get um, builds from package from you, you will get builds where the, the, the evaluation is still in progress. So it has compiled, I don't know, 50% of the job, but it hasn't compiled open open office yet. So that's why the official cache is not updated, but the packages that are there, you can already download them. Um, the reason why we don't always install stuff so that it talks to this, this uh, server is because this is a moderately expensive operation for the server. So when, if all Nix users would always talk to this server and try to get binary package from it, it would at some point explode and it's already uh, very, very busy with just building, right? These answering those requests is unfortunately kind of expensive because when it has the binary, it creates a tar file on the fly, zips that with base, it trans transports it over the network. And just this bzip phase is actually kind of expensive for last packages. It's, uh, it's a shame. <laughs> the, this uh, crypto server is my is the server I run. Um, the difference between those is that the, the crypto server, it has only binaries for Linux 64-bit, but it has binaries for basically everything in, for that 
every Haspel package has their binary for it and it's fast. So when you have a change in the master branch on, on GitHub, then this server will have binaries already because they are built there before we push them to master. So this has all the binaries for, for the 64-bit Linux. Um, the server below is slower, so this will lag behind the other server by two or three days in terms of what it has, what is compiled there. Um, the advantage is that this server has also binaries for Darwin, 32-bit Linux, and so on. Right? And obviously this server has packages for all of Nix, all of NixOS. And this server above has only Haskell packages. Crypto uh, only Haskell. Yeah. I mean, there are GHC and, and that related, the, the standard environment, is that's all there, obviously, right? But this one builds, basically, Nixus Org builds everything. And the uh, um, crypto server builds Haskell packages and all that you need to build that. Okay, when using, when using binary packages, there is a nice feature of GHC that uh, you have to be aware of. <laughs> the, <coughs> the compiler, when it builds a library, it computes some kind of identifier that uniquely identifies this version of the library. So it computes the hash over, I don't know, the interface definitions of all the functions you have in the library and so on and so on, right? So that you are able, if you have a library in a certain, that has the same name and has the same version number, but you edited it during development and you say cabal install, then you have two libraries that are called foo 7.7 but they differ in that hash because the source code changed. So that's something that GHC does internally. When packages link, they refer to a particular version of the library using that hash. Okay, now you would assume Haskell is a purely functional language, so there is no side effects, right? What it means is here you have the source code of the library, there's your hash function, and there is your hash, right? This is a totally deterministic, reliable computation, but in the system, the GHC developers somehow manage to implement that in a way that is not deterministic. So what happens is that you compile a package on a machine, it, it gets assigned some hash. Then you compile the exact same package on the exact same machine again, and it gets a different hash. What this means is that in a distributed build farm, when one server computes the library text, and another server computes the library text, and they both end up assigning different hashes, then now a package that depends on text compiled here cannot link on this server, right? Because the hashes don't match. And since we have a distributed build farm, this actually happens quite a lot. So as a user, it looks like this, you run the build and everything looks perfectly fine. And then it says, yeah, this package is broken due to missing package such and such. And at that point, there is nothing we can do, we basically have to garbage collect all the stuff, throw all the packages away and download everything from scratch from one server. So, so from crypto or from deep science? Yeah. Okay. So the problem, the problem is um, it is kind of rare, it's not, it doesn't happen every day, it's not like you run into this like twice a day, that, that's not the case. But you run into it every now and then, it does happen. And it does happen more frequently if you mix binaries from different servers, you compile some locally, then you download some, then you compile some locally, then right, then the chances of these has mismatch things occurring are, are greater. And when that happens, you basically have to erase everything that depends on text. This library that's mentioned here, that's mentioned as broken, right? That must be garbage collected, must all be wiped out. Then download everything from one server again and then of recovered. It's uh, super unpleasant, but it's a feature of GHC, and uh, as of now, there is basically no one knows how to fix it. There is uh, what happens internally is that um, they have computations that should have been in the I/O monad, but they use lift uh, unsafe perform I/O to make them look pure, and then the outcome that you get depends on timing. So when your CPU schedules one computation before the other, then the hash will differ. So you have race conditions in the compiler. It doesn't matter for them because the code always works, always works, but it matters for us. And it's not going to go away soon, unfortunately. Okay, <coughs> now this was all very fast and I'm <laughs> sure if you didn't know most of it before already, you still don't know it now. But the good thing is that all of this information is available on the web as well. Um, 
there is this, this ticket at the very top. This is a kind of umbrella ticket which is called a document Haskell packages in Nix and it refers to everything else. So there is all the links here, they are, they are in there. There is a, this nice tutorial from Oliver Charles. There is the uh, journey into the infrastructure series that were postings on the mailing lists which go in great detail and all the technical details of the implementation and so on. And obviously you can always, if you have problems, ask on the Nixos IRC channel or post to the mailing list and people are typically super helpful and friendly and should be, should be fine. And this stuff, of course, all the examples, all the snippets are also available on GitHub. And I'm also here if you want to hack now and we can just set up whatever you're, you're interested in. Okay, that was it. Do you have any questions? Um. How much effort was it to set it up on Haskell? All this the whole infrastructure? Uh, hmm. <coughs> it's hard to say. It's an, it's an ongoing effort, right? We started five years ago maybe to automate builds with this Cabal to Nix tool. And at that time, everything was run manually. So when someone said, I want this package, then he personally ran this tool, generated the build, checked it into Nix package, and then it was there. And that worked nicely enough. And then I think last year we started saying, yeah, why do we even bother doing this manually? We just generate all the package into it and, and be done, right? And that turned out, out to be fairly easy. So um, I don't know, it's hard to say. There have been many, many people contributing to this over several years and it's a really an evolutionary process, I'd say. It's hard to estimate how long it took, but it's, uh, I think it's actually not that difficult. Um, the important part though is that we have it actually, we can easily do that in Nix because um, for us, if we have, for instance, a package that needs MTL 2.1 and we have another package that needs MTL 2.2, then for us this is not really a problem, right? We can have both versions. It's, uh, it's unpleasant to maintain multiple versions of the same library in Nix package free, but it's totally possible. Nix doesn't care. So if we need different versions of the same libraries to get stuff built, we can do it. Um, other distributions, for them, it's much, much more difficult, right? They don't, typically don't have more than one active version of one particular library. And so for them, getting a, a consistent package set where, let's say, half of package would compile is near impossible, but in Nix it's no big deal really because we can have many many versions of the same stuff and it doesn't matter. It's expensive to build but it's, uh, it's feasible. So you already started like a big comparison with other distributions. Yeah. Um, how would you, like the whole process of development and even deployment um, compared to Cabal, uh, what would be the advantages, the disadvantages, like why even start it? I mean, I know. Yeah. Why? No, the. I think the, the, the major advantage that you get from Nix is that um, we have this automatic process which basically updates all Haskell packages once an hour. Then we compile everything. And then a human being looks at the outcome of that build jobs and manually decides this looks good, we can merge that and publish it. So if someone publishes a change that breaks half the package set, then you as users of Nix package will not be exposed to that, right? Because then someone decides, no, we'll wait before we merge or we'll fix it before we merge or something. So it's a curated package set. It's fairly stable and reliable. You can rely on most of the things compiling and keep compiling. If you use Cabal install, you live in the wild. Right? So you say Cabal update and whatever is the state of Cabal at that point, that's what you're working with. And if people publish broken package descriptions, then your builds will not succeed and they will not necessarily give you a helpful error message. And it's, uh, 